Parshas Vezos HaBracha is the final 41 verses of the Torah, and it's continuing to recount the events of the last day of Moshe's life. And the parsha is neatly divided into two parts. First part is the final blessing that Moshe gives to the nation, each tribe. And the second part of the parsha, the end of the Torah, is the description of Moshe's death and his eulogy. Now, it's important to note that this parsha is the only one that does not have a dedicated Shabbos to read it. Instead, it's read on Simchas Torah, on the festival. We read it, and then right away, we roll the Torah all the way back to the beginning of Genesis, to Parshas Bereshis, and that really, I think, gets to a central Jewish idea that we're never really finished studying Torah. Each year, when we finish it, we go back to the beginning to try to go maybe a layer deeper in the endless strata of Torah. Now, like the previous parsha, Parshas Hazinu, the final part of the Torah and the blessing that Moshe conveys to the Jewish people, it's very poetic, it's very flowery, there is multitudes of commentaries, and like we always do, we're going to favor the teachings of Rashi. It begins, and this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, Isha Elohim, bestowed upon the children of Israel before his death. Rashi tells us what does it mean that Moshe has given the Jewish people a blessing before his death. Why? Because if he doesn't do it now, he'll never have the chance to do it. For the 40-year tenure of Moshe's leadership of the Jewish people, he was constantly admonishing, rebuking, even castigating the nation. The very last thing that he does before he dies, he's going to bless them. And maybe the idea is, Moshe was obligated to bless them as we shall see, and he kept on delaying it. He didn't want to do it. And now, the last day of his life, and he knows he's about to die, there's no more possibility of kicking the can down the road, he has to give them the blessing. He kept in the lane. He kept on pushing it off. And finally, when he couldn't push it off anymore, he gave them the blessing. Maybe we could suggest that this is the opposite of modern mores. Moses, he didn't coddle the nation. He was very demanding. He was very tough with the intention that that would be most effective in helping the nation grow and flourish. He was very wary of giving them blessings and giving them compliments because it could turn them into a different mindset, a mindset of accomplishment, of completion, of, of, of done, I've reached the promised land, and therefore he wanted to delay it as much as possible. There's a very interesting midrash quoted by the Ramban. The Ramban quotes the midrash that says that when Jacob, in the end of the book of Genesis, when he was blessing his children before he passed, the verse in chapter 49, verse 28 says, and this is what their father spoke to them. And says the Midrash that Moses begins his blessing with the same word. And this is the blessing that Moses conveys to the Jewish people. And the Midrash tells us that when Jacob concluded his blessing, he told them, I'm stopping halfway. I'm not fully done the blessing, but you should know in the future, there's going to be a man who is like me. And he too is going to pick up right where I left off. I'm ending my blessing with the word and this, and he's going to begin his blessing with the same word, vizos, and this. And Rashi later on actually tells us that the content of Moses' blessing were very similar to the blessings of Jacob. Jacob blessed each one of his children, and that was the individual's At this juncture, at the end of Deuteronomy, that individual child has burgeoned into an entire tribe, and now Moshe is going to amplify the blessing given to the individual to the entire tribe that they spawned. And Incidentally, we could point out that this is one of the many times that we see parallels between Moses and Jacob. For example, Rashi told us all the way beginning of Exodus that when Moses was looking for a spouse, He referred to Jacob's decision. When Jacob was looking for a spouse, he went to a well, and therefore Moses did the same. So that's one example of many where Moses modeled himself after Jacob. So how does the blessing begin? He said, Hashem came from Sinai, having shown forth to them from Seir, having appeared from Mount Paran, and then he approached with some of his holy myriads from his right hand, he presented the fiery Torah to them. So a very, again, poetic and flowery blessing. What exactly is going on? So Rashi tells us that before he begins to give the blessings to the individual tribes, he wants to first begin with praising of God in a way 
that highlights the praise of the Jewish people. We know that when you pray, you begin by praising God, and only then do you start asking for your personal needs. Similarly, the blessing that Moshe is going to give the Jewish people is requesting that the Almighty watch over that particular tribe and let them accomplish their mission and their mandate. So it's prefaced with the praise of God. What is this praise? The praise is this unique relationship that the Almighty has with the Jewish people. And that, of course, was consummated at Sinai. At Sinai, the Jewish people came to God. God came to the Jewish people. God descended upon the mountain like a groom who's going out to greet his bride. And we know the Talmud tells us, in reference here by Rashi, that before God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, he offered it to all the other nations. He went to Seir. Seir is, of course, Esau, Esau, he offered them the Torah. They said they, they're not interested. Ishmael, that is Mount Paran. They too did not want it. The Ramban adds that this pattern followed all the nation, not just the Abrahamic ones. Every nation rejected Torah. And then God came to Israel with myriads of angels and he gave them a Torah of fire from his right hand. And again, Rashi quotes the Talmud, a very deep idea, a very Kabbalistic idea that the Torah always existed in the form of black fire written on top of white fire. What that means, of course, is a very advanced idea, but that's the Torah fire that existed prior in the heavenly realm and God delivered it to us in a way that we can consume at Sinai. The Rabban understands this verse to reflect the closeness that the Almighty had with the nation with respect to making his presence among them and communicating to Moses. So God descended upon Sinai, and once he came to Sinai, so to speak, he left the heavenly realm and came here, came to terra firma, started speaking to Moses, that closeness never ceased. And even though the fire and the presence of God left Mount Sinai, it went to the tent of meeting and ultimately into the tabernacle. And for 40 years, Moses was in constant communication with God and God, God's presence was palpably felt within the tabernacle. And that was the portal where Moses would communicate to him. The verse continues, Indeed, you love the tribes greatly and all his holy ones were in your hands for they planted themselves at your feet, bearing the yoke of your utterances. Rashi points out here that every tribe is called a nation. There's this idea that God harbors the souls of the righteous and they're deserving of this closeness because of their commitment to Torah at the foot of the mountain. As we've spoken about in the past, the Talmud tells us that when God offered the Torah to Jewish people, he took the mountain, turned it upside down and threatened them. And that was the the moment of decision that the nation said, we're interested we're all in, we're accepting the Torah, and that's being invoked over here to highlight the merit of the Jewish people. Rashi offers a second explanation of what this means. And in the second explanation, when it talks about God loving the nation or the nations, it's not a reference to the Jewish nation or the Jewish tribes. Rather, it's a reference to the other nations, to the Gentiles. And the meaning behind it is that even at a time where God loves the Gentiles, loves the other nations, he shows, so to speak, a pleasant countenance to the other nations. And he allows them to do with the Jewish people as they see fit. Nevertheless, the righteous of the Jewish people, the good ones of the Jewish people, they cleave to God and they do not deviate from him and you still preserve them. They accept the decrees foisted upon them with joy and with understanding. Even at a time when things are really bad for us, the righteous ones, they still stick with God. Verse 4, the Torah that Moses commanded us is the heritage of the congregation of Jacob. Incidentally, the Talmud tells us when a child matures to the degree that starts speaking, this verse, chapter 33, verse 4, that's the first words that the father, that the parents should train the child to say, Torah, Sivalanu Moshe, Morashat, Hilas Yaakov. Torah was commanded us by Moses. It is the heritage of the congregation of Israel. Meaning, says Rashi, that this is our heritage. We're going to cleave to it. We're going to seize it, seize it with an S, 
and we're not going to abandon it. The Ramban, very interesting Ramban here, but the Ramban points out that it doesn't say the house of Jacob. It doesn't say the progeny of Jacob. It says the congregation of Jacob. This special union that our nation has forged with God, it's not a matter of something hereditary. It's not even the house of Jacob. It's the community, the congregation of Jacob, meaning that if someone's not part of that, they can still join. And this is hinting, says the Ramban, that there's going to be converts who are going to join the house of Israel, the congregation of Israel, and they're going to be part of the expanded people and therefore uses a more inclusive term, the congregation of Israel. Verse 5, he became king over Yeshurun when the numbers of the nation gathered the tribes of Israel in unity. The Bible explains that what this means is that God is the king over the Jewish people when all of us, our heads, our elders, our judges, all the tribes of Israel, all of us together, we accept his kingdom, his dominion upon us for generations, and we observe his Torah, and thus he becomes our king. Verse 6 begins with the individual blessings for the individual tribes. It begins, the first blessing is for Reuven, for Reuben. May Reuben live and not die, and may his population be included in the count. Rashi tells us that Reuben, the tribe of Reuben, should live, they should flourish in this world, and they should not die in the next world. And the episode, the shameful episode of Reuben's life, namely when he tampered with his father's bed sleeping arrangement, that should not be invoked again. The Ramban explains that Reuben goes first because he was the firstborn and because Moses wanted to expiate the sin of tampering with his father's bed. After Reuben comes Judah. And this to Judah. And he said, Hearken, O Hashem, to Judah's voice and return him to his people. May his hands fight his grievance and may you be a helper against his enemies. Rashi explains that Judah is juxtaposed to Reuben because they share a crucial attribute. Just as Judah admitted his flaws, admitted his sin in the episode of Tamar, so to Reuben in the episode of the reshuffling of his father's bed, he too admitted his sin, and therefore those two are put next to each other. The Ramban, he says that the reason why Judah is blessed next, even though he has two older brothers that are going to be leapfrogged over here. It's because when the nation had to go to war, the first one to sign up their militia to go wage war to conquer the land of Canaan, it was the tribe of Judah. And thus he became the representative of the Jewish people and therefore the blessing to Judah incorporates really everyone. Hear his voice, says Rashi, that's a reference to the kings of Judah when they pray, you should listen to them, let them be victorious in war, let them return home in peace. The next tribe is Levi. Of Levi said, your Tumim and your Urim befit your devout one whom you tested at Massa and whom you challenged at the waters of Meribah. Levi, he neighbored Judah in the encampment, and therefore there is a connection between the preceding tribe and Levi. And Rashi points out this is not speaking to Levi, but rather speaking about the tribe of Levi. And it was praising Levi that the role that they have as the leaders of the Jewish people, as the clergy of the Jewish people, is justly theirs. They, unlike the rest of the tribes, they didn't test God. Alternatively, the Ibn Ezra explains that they withstood every test with the sole exception of the waters of Meribah, and it continues to praise the tribe of Levi. The one who said of his father and mother, I have not favored him. His brothers, he did not give recognition. And his children, he did not know. For they, the Levites, have observed your word and your covenant they preserved. Actually, explains that this is a reference to the aftermath of the sin of the golden calf. Moses made a call, who is to God? Come join me. And the entire tribe of Levi, they came they grabbed their weapons and they avenged God by killing all the participants of the sin of the golden calf, even if they were close relatives. In addition, they preserved the covenant of God. They were the only tribe to circumcise in the wilderness. The Talmud explains that in the wilderness, the conditions were such that it was deemed to be unsafe, dangerous to circumcise young boys and thus 
The rest of the tribe said, we're not going to circumcise our boys. But the tribe of Levi, they preserved the covenant of God. They took the risk and therefore they are praised for their commitment, their stalwart commitment to God by circumcising their children in the wilderness. And as a result, they are worthy of having all the leadership positions that they're given. They should teach the ordinances to Jacob. They shall place incense before your presence. They should do burnt offerings on your altar. Bless, O Hashem, his resources and favor the work of his hands. Smash the loins of his foes and his enemies that they may not rise. Bless their warriors. Don't allow them to be diminished because of their holy work. Of course, we know the episode of the sons of Aaron, that the Levites and the Kohanim from the tribe of Levi, they engage in perilous, sometimes dangerous work in the tabernacle. And this is a prayer, explains the Ramban, to not allow them to suffer because of their holy work. In addition, it's also a blessing to quash anyone who questions the primacy of the Kohanic tribe. After the tribe of Levi comes the tribe of Benjamin. Of Benjamin, he said, May Hashem's beloved dwell securely by him. He hovers over him all day long and rests between his shoulders. Rashi explains that the tribe of Benjamin, they were apportioned the plot of land that's going to include Jerusalem. And this is a reference to that. And because the tribe of Joseph, they had the plot of land that included the site of Shiloh, which was the home to the tabernacle for 369 years. But because Jerusalem, where the permanent temple was built, is greater than Shiloh, where the temporary temple was built, therefore Benjamin comes before Judah in the blessing. Now, there's an interesting Rashi here that says, what does it mean that God's dwelling place, i.e. the temple, rests between his shoulders, it says that really the place where the temple was built, there was one spot that was slightly taller, but the between the shoulders is more beautiful than the shoulders. I don't know, I don't know exactly what that means, but there's an interesting Rashi there. Now the Ramban here, the Ramban references the three temples. There's three clauses in this blessing to Benjamin. The first one, May Hashem's beloved, beloved dwell securely by him. That's a reference to the first temple. The second temple where God's hovering over it, i.e. the presence of God, is not as secure, so to speak, in the temple. That's a reference to the second temple. And finally, and rest between his shoulders, that is a reference to the third temple, the pending temple, where Jerusalem will be rendered a chair for God, a throne for God, i.e. it's going to be the time of Messiah and the time of completion. Joseph is given a very long blessing, which hints at the tremendous bountiful land that he was given. Of Joseph, he said, blessed by Hashem is his land, with a heavenly bounty of dew, and with the deep water crouching below, with the bounty of a son's crops. And Rashi explains each one of these citations, what it means. A sovereignty is his ox-like one. Majesty is his, and his glory will be like the horns of the Re'emim. With them shall he gore nations together to the ends of the land. They are the myriads of Ephraim and the thousands of Menasha. Rashi explains that these are references to Joshua, who descended from the from Joseph and and Gidon as well, these were great leaders of the Jewish people, and uh, they engaged in the wars of God, and myriads of their enemies were destroyed by Ephraim and thousands by the descendants of Menasha. After Joseph comes Zevulon and Issachar, these two were brothers and partners, and even though Issachar Issachar was older. Here in the blessing, Zebulon is given premacy. Of Zebulon is said, rejoice, O Zebulon, in your excursions, and Yisachar in your tent. Rashi explains that these two brothers had a special arrangement. Zebulon was the businessman, he was the merchant, and he would go on these long business excursions, whereas his brother, his partner, Yisachar, would remain in the tent studying Torah. This is the famous yisachar Zvulun agreement where half of the income, of the financial income, that Zavulan got was given to Yisachar, and half of Yisachar's Torah was given to Zavulan. And because Yisachar cannot study in Torah without the business activities 
of Zavulon. Therefore, Zavulon is given primacy, and he is mentioned in this verse before his older brother, Yisachar. The tribes will assemble at the mount. There they will slaughter offerings of righteousness, for by the riches of the sea they will be nourished, and by the treasures concealed in the sand. This, Rashi tells us, is a reference to the discovery of special snails or special creatures that are used to make treles, which are found by the seafaring Zevulan. Now, there's an interesting Arachim here. He notes that Zevulan is described as being joyous. Be joyous in your excursion. You're going on a business trip? Have a good time. Make sure you get a nice first-class ticket and a five-star hotel. And he notes that typically, from the Torah's perspective, matters of this world are not things to be joyous with. And he quotes a verse to prove that, but of course, as many sources to indicate that we view this world as a transitory world, a world that we're trying to get to a goal, i.e. the spiritual world, Olam Abba. Yet Zavulon, in his business excursions, were told that he should be happy, he should be joyous. And the answer is, because Zavulon, he is engaging in the holy pursuit of supporting the Torah scholar, supporting Yisachar, therefore his pursuit, even though on a surface level, it is a pursuit of material wealth. The truth is, it's something which is worthy, which warrants joy, because it's been upgraded to a spiritual pursuit because of the union that he made with his brother Yisachar. Now, in verse 19, there's an interesting Rashi here. What does it mean that the tribes will assemble at the mount? Verse 19, as a result of Zavulon, Everyone's going to gather by this mount. So Rashi tells us, according to the Midrash, that because Zavulon was such a, a businessman, the merchants would travel to Israel to go do business with Zavulon. And once they get to Israel, they do their business with Zavulon. And even though they're at the edge of the land, that the coastal area where Zavulon's tribe was given their land, they say, you know what? We travel this whole long distance. Let's go tour the land of Israel. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's see what is this God? What is this religion of the Jewish people? And they arrive at Jerusalem and they see the temple, how people are behaving. And they discover, they get a window into the nature of the Jewish people. And they're so impressed. And they're so wowed by what they do, they all decide they want to convert. And there, so continues the verse, the tribes will assemble at the mount, i.e. the tribes, the rest of the nations. They're going to come to the mount, i.e. Mount Moriah, to Jerusalem. There they will slaughter the offerings of righteousness. They're going to be so moved by their experience, they're going to have the desire to cleave to this nation and to convert. Very interesting. The next brother, the next tribe that is blessed by Moses is the tribe of Gad. Of Gad, he said, blessed is he who brought his Gad. He dwells like a lion tearing off arm and even head. So Rashi explains this reference to the size of the portion of Gad and the strength of her fighters. Because the tribe of Gad was on the border, they had to be strong to deal with any enemy incursions, and therefore they are compared to a lion. And they're also portrayed as having superhuman strength to be able to cut up their enemies by tearing off an arm and even a head. Now, the Baal Turim notes that this verse, this very short verse on the tribe of Gad actually contains all the letters of the Torah, and that's because Moses, at the end of the parasha, is going to be buried in the land given to the tribe of Gad, and because Moses is someone who is the ultimate embodiment of a person who obeyed the entirety of Torah from beginning to end, from A to Z, from Aleph to Taf, therefore all the letters of the alphabet of the Hebrew alphabet are included in the verse describing the tribe in which Moses is buried. Really interesting. And then the verse continues, he chose the first portion for himself, for that is where the lawgiver's plot is hidden. He came at the head of the nation, carrying out Hashem's justice and his ordinances with Israel. So two points here in the verse. Number one, Gad chose that particular location because they wanted to own the spot where Moses was buried. 
And the second idea is that they upheld their commitment, their agreement, that even though they're going to have a land on the east bank of the Jordan, they're going to join the Jewish brethren in crossing over the Jordan, conquering the land, distributing the land to the various tribes, and only then return to their families on the other side of the Jordan. Now, there's a very interesting idea here that Rashi tells us, that the verse tells us, that the reason why the tribe of Gad wanted that location was because that's where Moses was going to be buried. The problem is that in the book of Numbers, it's quite clear that they wanted the East Bank of the Jordan as grazing area for their sheep and for their cattle. So what's this idea they wanted Moses? So which one is it? Did they want the land because Moses was going to be buried there? Or did they want the land because it was suitable for their sheep and their flock? So there's a Hasidic idea here that in the book of Numbers it says that they wanted to have that land because they told Moses their rationale was that they have mikne rav, which could mean – Lots of sheep. But if you read it in a creative way, it could also be interpreted as mitne rav. They wanted to acquire a rav, a rabbi, which is an interesting Hasidic idea. Maybe the alternative answer is that initially they wanted it because it was a great spot for grazing. But then when they discovered that Moses was going to be buried there, they reformatted, they repurposed the reason why they wanted that particular portion of land, now they really wanted it for the other reason. The next tribe is the tribe of Dan. Dan is compared again to a lion. Rashi tells us he too was on the border and therefore he has to be, he was encouraged and given the strength to deal with the threats on the border. Naphtali is satiated with favor. He was filled with Hashem's blessings. Go possess the sea and its south shore. So Rashi understands this simply, that his land was full of everything and its inhabitants had everything that they desired. The Ramban quotes an interesting Midrash. The Midrash says, what does it mean that it was filled with Hashem's blessing, go possess the sea and its south shore? What this is hinting at is that if you obey the will of God, you're going to possess the sea and the South Shore, that's a reference to both this world and the next world. The next tribe is the tribe of Asher. It's going to be the last tribe that's given a blessing from Moses. Of Asher, he said, the most blessed of children is Asher. He shall be pleasing to his brothers and dip his feet in oil. Rashi tells us right away that he doesn't really know exactly how Asher is being blessed with his children. But he does add that the daughters from the tribe of Asher would marry the high priest and the land is also replete with oil. There's an interesting Balaturim here. The Balaturim says that the brothers of Asher, the sons of Jacob, they suspected that Asher betrayed their trust because when the brothers sold Joseph as a slave, they made a pact within them that no one's going to reveal what happened to Joseph, his whereabouts, what the brothers did. No one's going to tell that to Jacob. Now, incidentally, in the book of Genesis, maybe you'll recall, even Isaac knew about it. He didn't tell Jacob. Even God, of course, knew about it. And even God felt obligated by this pact, and he too did not reveal it to Jacob. However, there was someone who did. After Joseph reconnected with his brothers, the daughter of Asher, Serach bat Asher, she knew prophetically of Joseph's sale and everything that happened to him, and she revealed it to Jacob. And the brothers suspected, how did Asher's daughter, how did she know what happened to Joseph? It must mean she heard it in her home. She heard her father and mother talking about it, and thus... Asher betrayed our trust, and they decided to excommunicate him. And here Moses is providing the antidote for his excommunication. That's what the Baal says. The most blessed of children is Asher. When someone is excommunicated by the halachic standard, they're not allowed to engage in marital intercourse. And therefore, Asher has children. Are those children legitimate? So what does Moses do? 
he says, blessed is their children. The brothers and the rest of the tribes, they were distant from Asher. They said, hey, he's someone who betrayed our trust. And therefore, in order to restore the closeness between Asher and his brothers, Moses continued, he shall be pleasing to his brothers. When someone is excommunicated, they're not allowed to smear themselves with oil. And therefore, Moses says he should dip his feet in oil. And finally, the next verse is that his shoes should be made of metal. And that's a reference to the fact that he can walk around with shoes, unlike someone that's communicated, who has to walk around barefoot. Okay, so that's the end of the blessings that Moses gives to the tribes of Israel. Now, you may have noticed that there was one tribe that was omitted namely the tribe of Shimon. So Rashi says that the reason why Shimon was omitted, there's no blessing given to Shimon, it's because the tribe of Shimon, they participated in the sin spawned, provoked by Bilam with the daughters of Moab, and they did the idolatry with Baal Pa'ar. And therefore, their punishment, so to speak, is that they are not given a blessing. The Rabban does not like this interpretation of Rashi for a variety of reasons. Number one, he says, well, lots of tribes participate in that sin. In addition, the people who participated, they already died. So the people who survived, the people who are around here are ones who obviously, by definition, did not participate in that sin. So why should they suffer? And he asks in general, like, why is Moses erasing a whole tribe? And he also notes that you know, the whole the whole nation participated in the sin of the golden calf, but they were forgiven. So there's this concept of repentance, of forgiven, of expiation. So why is that sin, the sin of Baal Pa'or, why is that lingering with the tribe of Shimon? And therefore the Ramban proposes a different reason as to why the tribe of Shimon was excluded. And he starts off with the principle. The principle is that whenever we're discussing the tribes of Israel, the number can never be more than 12. It's always got to be 12. There's 12 months and there's 12 constellation signs and 12 is the number which is always associated with tribes of Israel. There's always got to be 12. The problem is is that there's really 13 because Joseph was split into two and therefore you have a 13th tribe in Ephraim and Menashe. And therefore, when Moses was blessing the tribes of Israel, he had to disinclude at least one of them. So typically, either Joseph is included or Levi is disincluded. But for various reasons, Moses wanted to mention both Ephraim and Manasseh and the tribe of Levi. Therefore, he had to disinclude a different tribe and it couldn't be the usual suspects and therefore, the tribe of Shimon was chosen for a few reasons. Number one, Shimon was a very small tribe. And number two, they were dispersed throughout the rest of the tribes. And therefore, they're going to absorb the blessing of the tribe in which they're going to be located. And that's the idea. The idea is that Shimon did get a blessing. They weren't cut out of this blessing of Moses. It's just they got it via the host tribe in which Whatever Shemanite is located in that particular tribe, he absorbs that blessing. After Moses concludes blessing the tribes individually, he begins to address the nation as a whole. And he tells them, there is none like God, O Yeshurun. He rides across heaven to help you and in his majesty through upper heights. That is the abode of God and memorial. And below are the world's mighty ones. He drove the enemy away from before you and he said, destroy Thus Israel shall dwell secure, solitary. Rashi tells us that because God is with us, even when we're alone, we have our protection. Fortunate are you, O Israel. Praiseworthy are you, O Israel. Ashrecha Yisrael. Who is like you, O people? Delivered by Hashem, the shield of your help. Who is the sword of your grandeur? Your foes will try to deceive you, but you will trample their haughty ones. Thus, concludes the blessings of Moses. Chapter 34, the final chapter of the Torah, is the description of the death and the burial and the eulogy of Moses. Now, there's a very big discussion here as to who was the author, who was the scribe of the final chapter of the Torah. So, Rabbi Bechai, he quotes the Ibn Ezra, 
the Ibn Ezra says that chapter 34 in its entirety were all written by Joshua because it's describing Moses ascending the mountain and that obviously once it happened, it couldn't be written down because Moses was already going to be passed away and therefore there's no way that Moses wrote it. It must be that Joshua wrote it. Now, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar does not like that. Rather, he explains, based upon the Talmud, that it's possible that Moses wrote the entire Torah from beginning to end, but because he wrote it prophetically, it can also be written before the events that it's describing actually transpired. And he actually gives examples in the Torah where it describes predictions in the future, and even though they haven't happened at that juncture, they're still described as if they happened in the past. So we'll see more about that in just a little bit. So what happens here in chapter 34, the final chapter of the Torah? Moses ascended from the plains of Moab to Har Nebo, to Mount Nebo, to the summit of the cliff that faces Jericho, and Hashem showed him the entire land. Rashi tells us that this is not just the physical land, the territory of the land of Israel, but the history of the land. What happens to it in peace? What happens to it in war? Who are the oppressors that are going to oppress it? And the various different people that it's describing here, these are events in the future history of the Jewish people. So the verse says, he showed Moses the Gilead as far as Dan. That is a reference to the time, the book of Judges, where the members of the tribe of Dan, they made an idol and they started worshiping it. And he also showed that the great Shimshon, Samson, is going to come out of the tribe of Dan. All of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, the entire land of Judah, as far as the Western Sea. That's a reference to Joshua in his wars with the kings of Canaan. That's a reference to Gidon, the, the judge in his wars with Midian and Amalek, the kings of Judah. Of course, that's a description of the kings from the house of David. As far as the Western Sea, Rashi tells us that that's a reference to the very end of history, every event that's going to happen to the Jewish people until the resurrection of the dead. And the verse continues that Moses was shown the Negev, the plain, the valley of Jericho, the city of Day Palms, as far as Tsoar. Rashi again explains that all the things that it's hinting at, Solomon making the vessels of the temple. And finally, and Hashem said to him, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see with your own eyes, but you shall not cross it over. Rashi tells us this reference to a conversation that Moses is going to have with Abraham. I'm showing you this land, and you're about to pass, and when you get to heaven, I want you to go over to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, and affirm to them that the oath that God swore to them was actually fulfilled. And therefore, the reason why I'm showing you the land is because I want you to go tell Abraham that indeed God kept his word. And the Talmud actually points out that from this we see that the dead can't communicate with each other and the dead are aware of what's happening in the earth. And even though this hasn't actually happened, the nation has not yet conquered the land of Canaan, but because they conquer already the, the eastern portions and they're right on the doorstep of conquering the western portions of the land as well, it's considered as if they are already on their way of doing it. It's close enough and therefore God's already keeping his word. Verse 5, so Moses, servant of God, died there in the land of Moab. Rashi quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says, you know, we have here a description of Moses dying. Is it possible that Moses wrote that? So the Talmud quotes two opinions. Until here, were written by Moses. From here on, it was written by Joshua. That's the first opinion. Rabbi Meir, a second opinion, he says, no, it's not possible to have a Torah scroll lacking a letter or a word or a few sentences. And therefore, when Moses hands the Torah scrolls to the Jewish people, it must have been complete Torah scrolls. And therefore, it must mean that Moses wrote the entire Torah. And this portion where Moses had to describe his own passing, Moses wrote it bidema, which means simply means he wrote it with tears. Now, there's an interesting comment here from the Gon of Vilna. He points out that the word dema, which means tears, but the root of the word is confusion. 
And what he suggests is that these two opinions quoted by Rashi from the Talmud, they're actually both true. Moses wrote a bedema. Moses wrote it with confusion. Moses wrote it, but the letters were scrambled. The letters were not broken into words. And Joshua unscrambled them into words. And thus, both opinions offered by Rashi are both true because Moses wrote it bedema. He wrote it in confusion. It wasn't clear. The words were not spelled out. And Joshua, he completed it. He organized those words, those letters that Moses wrote into coherent sentences that we read today. Maybe we could suggest a second answer or a second explanation as to what this means that Moses wrote it bedema. We know the Talmud tells us that there are certain portals of prayer that are never sealed. Of course, Yom Kippur just passed. And on Yom Kippur, we have the Ne'ilah, which is the sealing of the doors. This is the last moment. This is the bottom of the ninth. This is the 90th minute. This is the end. This is your last chance to petition God to have a great year. Yet the Talmud says, even after Ne'ilah, even after those gates, the typical gates of prayer have been sealed, there's one gate that always remains open, and that is the gates of tears. There's a certain kind of expression of prayer when someone prays with tears that that portal is never closed up. Maybe we could suggest that Moses, he's been petitioning God in the conventional way to rescind the decree to enter the land. And he's tried everything. And he tried the 515 prayers that we read about in the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. And God said, no, 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 no. And here at the very end of his life, he knows he's destined to die today. And he's writing the description of his own death. How does he write it? He writes it with tears. He's hoping one last ditch effort with tears to maybe forestall his death and enter the land. Now, Rabbi Bukhai here points out a very interesting idea that at the beginning of the parsha, it describes Moses as the man of God, Ishalokim. And here, after Moses is passed, or after the description of Moses pass, passing, it describes him as the servant of God. And he tells us that the apex of human achievement, the greatest description that could be given to man, is that they're a servant of God. Just like a servant is always accompanying their master, always there to tend to the master, Moses was always there for God, always together and ready for the spiritual experience, always in close proximity to God. And this honorific, where Moses is called the servant of God, was only given to him after he died, because when a righteous person dies, they're even greater than they were when they are alive. And he adds another point based upon a midrash. The midrash says that God does not apply the term holy one to the righteous until they are placed in the earth. Why? Because until someone's dead, until they've passed, until the Yetzirah has been taken away from them, God does not trust them because who knows, maybe they will still go astray. Now, with respect to the passing of Moses, there's a very long and very powerful and evocative midrash about the death of Moses it begins by talking about how God wanted to take away Moses' soul and sent a variety of angels to try to extract Moses' soul, and Moses fended them off. And then God himself said, I'm going to go take Moses' soul. I'm going to bring about the death of Moses. And God calls out to the soul of Moses, and he says to the soul, My daughter, I have placed you in the body of Moses for the past 120 years. Come out. Don't delay. It is your time now for you to come and to be elevated to heaven. And she responded. The soul responded to God. I know that you are the God of all the spirits and all the souls are in your hand. And I know that you placed me and formed me in the body of Moses. Is there a holier body? Is there a better place? To be then in the body of Moses, in Moses' body in which no worms and no maggots appeared forever? There's never been flies buzzing upon him? I don't want to leave. There's no better place for me to be than in the body of Moses. And God says, well, come out. I'm going to put you in the heavens near all the angels. I'll put you right underneath the throne of glory 
by the seraphim, the alfanim, all the other angels? And the soul again responded, there's no better place, even next to the angels, than the body of Moses. And it continues that at that time, God, in this very high way, the greatest kind of death possible, took out the soul, and everyone was crying. And again, this is a very advanced midrash, but the, the angels were crying, and God was crying, and the earth was crying, and the, the order of Genesis was crying, the moon, the moon, the stars, the sun, all the galaxies were crying, all of Israel was crying. There's a very uh, powerful, very evocative midrash here about the death of Moses. I advise people to read it. It's a very powerful description of what's happening over here. So he buried him in the depression in the land of Moab, opposite Baal Pa'or, and no one knows his burial place till this day. Rashi offers two explanations as to who buried Moses. According to one, God buried Moses. Alternatively, Moses buried himself. Moses was someone who conquered death. And thus, normally when someone dies, they have to have someone else bury them. Moses was able to bury himself because he was above that. He became like an angel even in his lifetime. No one knows where he is buried. The Talmud tells us that the Romans tried to discover where Moses was buried. So they sent a message to the garrison who was in charge of that particular location. Find for us the burial place of Moses. So they went to the top of the mountain and it looked like it was below them. They went to the bottom of the mountain and it looked like it was above them. They split up into two groups, the ones who were up thought it was down, and the one who were, the one who were down thought it was up to fulfill this verse, chapter 34, verse 6, that no one can know where he is buried. And the Torah transitions here to describe the eulogy of Moses. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes had not dimmed. His vigor was not diminished. The children of Israel bewailed Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him. The children of Israel obeyed him and did as Hashem commanded Moses. Never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom God has known face to face. The level of prophecy of Moses was unparalleled by any other prophet amongst the Jewish people. Talmud points out that it's only amongst the Jewish people that there cannot be anyone like Moses but amongst the nations, there was one candidate that rivaled Moses, namely that was Bilam. Never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom Hashem had known face to face, as evidenced by all the signs and wonders that Hashem sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his courtiers and his land, and by the all the strong hand and awesome power that Moses performed before the eyes of all of Israel. Rashi describes what each one of these descriptions mean. What does it mean, the strong hand? That he received the tablets of the Torah in his hand. There's two amazing insights that I saw from the Talmud. Number one, that Moses extracted the Torah, i.e. the tablets, from God. At the time the Jewish people were doing the sin of the golden calf, God wanted to withhold the tablets from Moses, and Moses, using his strong hand, he was able to almost grab it from God, and that's why he's being praised with his strong hand. And then on the flip side, the Talmud also says that when he got there, he got to the bottom, and he sees the sin of the golden calf, and he realizes, how can I bring these tablets etched, inscribed by the finger of God, that talk about not having another God before me. And here you see the people, they're dancing in front of the golden calf. It would be fatal for me to have the nation behaving in this way, juxtaposed in the same proximity of the tablets written by God saying not to do that. And therefore Moses shattered it. But the elders, they didn't want him to shatter it. And they tried to grab it out of his hands. And again, Moshe, with his strong hand, was able to overwhelm them and was able to shatter the tablets of God before the eyes of all of Israel. And this is the very last thing that the Torah tells us about Moses. He had this ultimate display of selfless leadership. He was willing to forfeit the tablets of God. Is there any greater achievement than a man ascending to heaven, being able to engage and negotiate and contend and overwhelm the angels and to come back down to earth bearing tablets created by God, inscribed by God, there's no greater achievement. 
Yet Moses forfeited that in order to spare the entire nation. And thus, that is the very last thing that we're told about Moses, that he was able to have the fortitude, the wherewithal, to be able to forego what would have been the greatest legacy of any human. And he forfeited, he shattered the tablets before the eyes of all of Israel to spare the nation. When we finish the Torah, traditionally we declare chazak, chazak finis chazek, be strong, be strong, and be strengthened. In addition, we declare hadra chalon, your glory is upon us. Yet we pledge hadra Allah, we will return to you. We will return to you the Torah. Please, God, without any, making any promises, Blin Adder will have a new Parsha podcast every week with renewed vigor, with renewed insight to study, to grow, to unlock the great potential that we have within us to go deeper, to plumb the depths of the Torah for another year. I want to say Mazel Tov to all of you that have completed the Torah. May you have tremendous success in all your endeavors. May you continue to strive to grow, to ascend to greater and greater heights. Thank you for being there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining me on this wonderful journey. My email address is rabbiwalbygmail.com. I look forward to beginning all the way, the beginning of the whole story, the beginning of the saga, the beginning of the lessons in the book of Genesis and Parshish Next week, together with you in good health and in good spirits.